part two of our study about Christmas. As this is a family study, to show myself, I'm able to be learned, my wife and my children, why I will not allow Christmas in my house. I pray that after this study, you'll see that this is a pagan, that it's wrong. I'll leave the decision up to you. I'm not going to force it down your throat. But I'd like to open up with uh, scripture in Ephesians chapter 5. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us, and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling Savior. But fornication, now watch it, if you go, you gotta go back and listen to the first one. Because you're going to see things in Ephesians as we continue in part two. But it says, neither, uh, verse three, excuse me, but fornication. We read about orgies and uncleanness and covetousness. Let it not be once named among you as becoming saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Listen, if you partake of this as a Christian, you won't go to hell, but you'll lose your inheritance in the millennium. Let no man deceive you with vain words. We're going to look at words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. But ye, excuse me, be ye not therefore partakers with them. And some of you are. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, and in righteousness, and in truth, providing what is acceptable unto the Lord. This is not acceptable. What we're studying about part two and part one and all the other parts is not approved of God. You're going to see it. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. That is why I'm doing this. Name a verse, Brother Stolly, why you're doing this. Ephesians 5.11 And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Some of these things are a shame. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. I want to shed light in your life. For whosoever does make manifest is light. I want to show you life and light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepeth, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. So, the, yeah, so, verse 15 again. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Redeem the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. You need to get part two. Uh, we are in part two, excuse me. You need to get part one of this study. You need to hear it all. I'm not going to do a review. The review, go back and listen. And get this as we continue part two. Now, number two, nativity scenes. Are tainted with paganism. You know, the little baby and Joseph and Mary and all that. And you know how many churches are going to have them? You know how many churches are going to have their children dress up as Mary and as Joseph and a little baby doll with a hundred light bulb? And the shepherds and some will even have real animals. Nearly every form of pagan worship descend from the Babylonian mysteries. With focused attention on the mother godness and the birth of her child. The, the mother godness and the birth of her child is nothing new and is not just in the Bible. It's paganism. 
This was adapted to marrying Jesus worship. Notice how Mary comes first. When you read in Matthew and you read in the book of Luke, Jesus came before Mary. Read it. Worship which then easily accommodated the multitude of pagans converted to Christian inside Constantine's Roman Catholic Church. Remember, this report's not mine. I'm just reading. If anyone were to erect statues or images of Mary and Joseph by themselves, many within the Protestant circles would cry, IDOLATRY! IDOLATRY! But every Christmas it's allowed. Why is that? But at Xmas, I'm going to take the Christ Mass out. We learn about the Christ Mass. I'm going to call it Xmas. I am not going to put Christ back into a pagan. You try to put Christ back into in the Christmas, you are wrong. But Xmas time, an image of a little baby is placed with the images of Mary and Joseph, and it's called the nativity scene. Somehow the baby idol sanctifies the scene and is no longer considered idolatry. Check out Exodus 20 verses 4 and 5. Exodus 32, 1 through 5. And, uh, and Exodus 32, 9 and 10 about idolatry. It does not say thou shalt not have the idols, but you can have a baby doll. No loopholes. Number three. You might want to close your ears. You might want to go cry into your pillow. You might want to go to your fairy hunky little pastor and he'll pat you in the back and say, Brother Stahl, is such a meanie. You can keep your things because we're going to look at the Christmas tree. Evergreen trees. Because of their ability to remain green throughout the winter season when most other forms of vegetation are dormant. Have long symbolized immortality, fertility, sexual potency, and reproduction like the bunnies. And were often brought into homes and set up as an idol. Exodus 20, verse 4 and 5. Exodus 32, 1 and 5. Exodus 32, 9 and 10. Fits right along with that little baby, doesn't it? The little doll baby, I guess you would say. The full mystical importance of the evergreen can only be understood when one considers the profound reverence the ancient pagans had for the all-natural phenomenon. And this is, this is a quote. I'll start the quote. To them, nature was everywhere alive. Every fountain had a spirit. Every mountain its deity. Every water grove and metal its supernatural association. The whispering of trees with the subtle speech of the gods who dwell in them. End of quote. W. M. Arnold, capital A U L D, and Christmas traditions. See, I'm not. It's not just me saying this. This is nothing but nat nature worship. God is in the trees. God is in this. God is in the meadows. The custom of bringing the tree into a home and decorating it as is done today has legendary been credited to Martin Luther. In truth, oh, you mean it was a lie. We have to look at it in truth. Have I become your enemy because I have spoken the truth? I didn't quote that verse completely. But am I your enemy because I speak the truth? The modern custom has been lost in unimportance but almost every culture has some sort of tradition such tradition for ages evergreens would be brought into a house during the winter as magic symbols oh. you know what God says about magic do you magic symbols of lux you know what lux is lux 
You know what the Latin is? Latin brings you to Lucifer. And hope for a fruitful year to come. It may also be that the star with which many of today's trees are taught did not originate as a representation of the star that the wise men follow. We put that star up there because of the wise men. <clears throat> you lost. Johnny, tell them what they lost. They lost a whole bunch of crowns at the judgment seat of Christ my friend but rather a representation of the stars to which the ancient Chaldean astrologers look for guidance oh let's speak the truth let's get the truth out it is not the star of the of the mad guy it's the star of the astrologer you know when you open up your, your newspaper and you find that astrology chart there and then if you are a man in prison and you don't want to hear you're going to find new love today the first decorating of an evergreen was done by pagans oh wow in honor of their god adonis capital a d o n i s who after being slain was brought to life by the serpent Elscapius, capital A E S C U L A P I A P I U S. The representation of the slain Adelius, capital A D O N I S, was a dead stump of a tree around the snake. Uh, excuse me. Around this stump, coiled the snake, and that's his name, Alscopius. Sounds like Genesis chapter 3 to me. But get what the snake means in this. Mr. I want to have a Christmas tree and a Christian. That snake symbols of life restoring. You know what the Bible says in Revelation 12, what the old serpent is? I'll leave that for you to go find it out. Because if you're not going to search the scriptures, you're not going to listen to what I'm saying. You're going to call me every name on the book, and you're going to continue to keep your traditions, which defy the Bible. And God, from the roots of the dead tree, then comes forth another and a different tree, an evergreen tree, symbolic to pagans of a God who cannot die. A tree and a God that can't die. Hmm. Sounds kind of familiar to me. In Babylon, the evergreen tree came to represent the rebirth, reincarnation of Nimrod as his new son, son, capital S U N, Tammuz, capital T A M M U Z. You want to see an imitation Antichrist Jesus? You go study Tammuz. In Egypt, type of the world in the Bible, what God called Israel out of, this God was worshipped in a palm tree as Baal Tamar, capital B A L O, capital B A A L dash, capital T A M A R. Baal was a sun god. Heathen people, what about the heathen? The heathen people, yeah, the heathen people are you, the Christians, that do this mess. Heathen people in the land of Canaan also adopted the tree worship and called it Asherah. Capital A S H E R A H. A tree with its branches cut off was carved into a phyletic symbol. You know what phyletic means? <laughs> Check out a church steeple. Check, check out uh, obelisk. Some kind of erection, I guess you would say, to be clean. So this was going on in Egypt. This was going on in Babylon. This is going on in, in, the, in the land that, that God told them to, to kill all the people. And this goes on in 2013 in Christian homes. We're not done. The fir tree was worshipped in Rome 
has the same newborn God named Belbera. Capital B A A L dash capital B E R I T H. Ready? Can I have a drum roll, please. Who was restored to life by the same serpent? Can I call this Christmas tree the tree of knowledge of good and evil? A feast was held in honor of him. Bell Bareth on December 25th. The guy that was restored to life, not born, but the guy that was restored to life by a serpent. Do you know who's going to be restored to life after he has a right arm and a right eye injury and they're going to make an image to him called the Antichrist? You know who the old serpent is is going to give life to a God that will be worshipped? Do you know Satan and the old serpent, the dragon? Evidently, Christian, that's who I'm talking to. I am not talking to unsaved people. I am talking to born-again Bible-believing Christians who are now in the church, as you say, RCC. Are worshipping the Antichrist with your tree. A feast was held in honor of him on December 25th, observed as the day on which the God reappeared on the earth and had been killed, and get this, and was reborn on that day, victorious over death. Well, my, 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 I guess we do have a birthday of a Savior. Bel Bareth, not Jesus. And he was reborn by death, given life by a serpent, the Antichrist. Fall down and worship the, the image. Meshach, Indigo, and Shadrach. It was called, ready for this? Are you ready for this? The birthday of the unconquered son, capital S. U N. I hope you're giving this stuff up. I hope you clean your lives up and put it under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that you're just going to listen to the rest of this for information purposes only. I hope I don't need to go any further to get you to repent. We're only on page five of twenty-six. <laughs> anyway. Thus, the annual, I like to think of another word, custom of erecting, that's an interesting word, and decorating evergreen trees. Remember, it was a philatelic symbol, and you erect it. I'm not trying to be gross. I'm just trying to be honest. Like Easter bunnies and eggs. And sending your little children to go find the eggs. I mean, all right. Decorating evergreen trees was brought down to us through the centuries by the pagan Roman Catholic Church. And you stand there and say you belong to a Baptist church and you put that tree up in your house. No, you belong to the Roman Catholic Church. I didn't say that. The paganism of Tammuz and Baal. Or the worship of the sun mingled with the worship of Aesculapius. The serpent. Whether erected in private homes or in churches, he says. <sighs> Gee, we were in a church that had a, the, 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 the Arsucopius serpent tree, weren't we? And he even had lights on it. Remember we talked about lights yesterday? The evergreen tree is a glaring symbol of this false god. Number four. Johnny, see what's behind curtain number four, please. Tell our contestants on how bad they are. Well, number four, before we get into it, we're going at the end of this study. We're going to see if we put Christ tag on anything, it becomes righteous. It becomes right. No. Oh, what's he going to kick this time? 
Christmas wreaths. Well, we don't believe in Christian wreaths. That, that's, that's pagan. Well, I'm glad you don't. Let's read. In pagan mythology, evergreen means eternal life and never dying existence. Wow, let me let me add an evergreen with a, with a chainsaw, and I'll show you everything eternal life. And with a big fire with marshmallows and, and all that. You ask my wife, I can get any tree to burn. Enough kerosene and gasoline and, and lighter fluid, I'll get the thing to burn. Show you everlast, everlasting life of a tree. Wait a minute, everlasting eternal life from a tree. Wait a minute, that's Jesus Christ. Not the cross. I'll cherish the old rugged cross. No, I cherish Jesus Christ. I'll cling to the old rugged cross. No, I'll cling to Jesus Christ, not a tree. I always say in jest, I don't mean to the the, the Pope fool at God and what he did, but it wouldn't have been great if God had Jesus Christ die in an electric chair. I'd love to see you have that wearing around your neck. I cherish and cling to the electric chair. <laughs> Made from evergreens, <laughs> Christmas wreaths were most frequently round. Why round? Why not square? Why not triangle? Ever ask yourself that? Which symbolize the sun, S-U-N. Just as do halos in most religious arts. You know those halos don't mean you're holy. It means you worship Baal. That light. Hence, the round Xmas wreaths. Don't say Merry Christmas. Say Happy Holidays. The Xmas reef stands for the eternal sun. Again, the sun's not eternal. It's going to go out one day. A never dying or self renewing sun. They haven't read their Bible, have they? In addition, the round form can be relate to the sign of the female. Wow. You can get turned on reading this stuff. Woohoo! Which stands for the regeneration of life. Because of these pagan associations, the Christian church was initially hostile towards the use of wreath and other green offshoots. Can't have it in our church! No! But in the same way it was Christianized. Other pagan traditions. The church soon found a way to confer its own symbolic meaning. What means what? Well, we want the reef in our church, but it, it represents this. I got an idea. Let's make it Christ. Let's say, let's give it a new name. Let's give it kind of things. Okay, ready for example? The sharp pointed leaves of the male holly. Oh, male holly? Didn't we just read about something with a female? Sexual? The leaves of the male holly came to represent Christ's crown of thorns. Wait a minute. Are you telling me that they crowned Jesus with holly? And then you turn around and say, Let's have a holly jolly Christmas mass. That sounds Christian, doesn't it? The leaves represent Christ's thorns. Already, we're not done. The red berries, his blood. Are you telling me that Christ's blood, Acts 20, 28, was, was holly berries? Maybe it came from Hollywood. Maybe I ought to take a piece of wood and smack you across the head. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? While the female ivy symbolizes mortality. Immortality. So this thing that represents Christ supposedly has a male and has a female uh, parts to it that represents not Christ, paganism. This is found so grave, capital S U L G R A V E, manner, capital M A N O R, 
uh, quotations, uh, Tudor, capital T-U-D-O-R, Christmas, end of quote, page six. I gave you the title, I gave you the person, and I gave you the page number of what Christians say and what the true identity is. You can't say I'm making this stuff up myself. Such reeves now not only adored churches at Christmas time. I find this one new. This one shocks me. A lot of this has been shocked me. But are also appearing during an equally pagan Easter season. Easter season. You got the Easter bunny. So when a woman wants to know if she's pregnant, they, they, they kill the bunny and check to see if she's pregnant. You mean you hide the eggs where it represents the female body and you send your children who are sperm to go find the egg? What are you saying? I'm saying you hide eggs like an egg is hidden inside of a woman and then you send your children as a representation of sperm to go find the egg. And that's in churches. I've seen the advertising. We're not done. Number five. Mistletoe. <clears throat> you're going to love this one. If, you, if you're still listening. The weak heart had already fell by the way. You need 911. You need oxygen. And uh, you know the, the thump on the chest. And get the cardiac going back and all that. For those that really love the Lord. They're, they're listening. And you... And you, you Probably, some of you probably repented. Thank God. Some of you are like, you, you got your jaw on the ground like, I can't believe this. I'm not part of this, but wow. And maybe you got some of this stuff in your thing, and you're like, uh -uh, no more. Praise God. Glory to God. These lessons have worked. Okay. Mistletoe. The use of the mistletoe plant, which is poisonous to both man and animal, can be traced back to the ancient Druids. Now the Druids were pagan Celtic priests who considered were magicians and wizards. You have read Book of Acts, right? I mean, Acts, excuse me. Exodus, Pharaohs, magicians and wizards. You know how many Christians are involved in that, that, that little boy wizard in the books and film? And you do know what God says about witches and magicians and wizards, don't you? No, because your church probably has those books in the library. It represents the false Messiah. Considered by the Druids to be a divine branch that had dropped from heaven and grew upon a tree on earth. Now where can you find that picture? This is me talking now. You ever see them have the picture of the dove with a branch in her mouth? Bingo! I didn't hear anybody call I-47. No. That's another problem church will deal with later. A bird. Well, divine branch that dropped from heaven. There's no bird mentioned, but you can put them all together. Well, that was supposed to be the representation of Noah and they are like the holly berries. You know, this is evident corruption of God's prophetic word concerning Christ. Ready? Where the Bible says, the man, the branch, end of quote. Coming from heaven. So this mistletoe is an antichrist of Jesus, who is the branch. The mistletoe symbolizes the reconciliation, now get this, between God and man. Now, if you're not telling me that this is not a representation of Jesus Christ as the Antichrist, what are you telling me? There's one meaning between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, Paul says. But you say the mistletoe is a reconciliation between God and man. First uh, John chapter, uh, end of chapter 1 into chapter 2. Our advocate. Your mistletoe says that the Bible says it's God, but your mistletoe says it's the mistletoe. 
since a kiss is well known for the symbol of reconciliation, asked Judas. You hate when I do things like that, don't you? This is now kissing under the mistletoe, under a poisonous plant. I wonder if Adam and Eve kissed at all underneath that tree of uh, that tree we talked about. Must have been the evergreen tree. No, it must have been the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You know, can you imagine well, Eve sitting there and Adam walks up to her. Hi, honey, how you doing? What you doing? Hey, I got this fruit here. <laughs> I don't know. Became accustomed both were tokens of reconciliation. Kissing under the mistletoe and the mistletoe has replaced Jesus Christ as your reconciliation to God. Are you going to continue? I'm going to continue. You need to read 1 John 1 9 and repent. The mistletoe being a sacred plant and a symbol of fertility. Wow, we keep getting sex. Imagine all this stuff from a from a church that says that their men and women can't have sex. Unless they do it a little on a wow. I didn't say that. I guess you can pay all kinds of money to get them off. I didn't say that either. Was well, also believed to contain certain magical powers. Magic again? I know what magical powers are. E pluminous yum, you are so stupid. This is the body of Jesus, and this is the blood of Jesus, you morons. Come up and eat it. Trans, trans, trans uh, whatever that's called. You know, the magic that they take the bread and, and the wine and turn it to Jesus Christ. That's a magic show. Oh, yeah, magic, mag, magicians pull bunnies out of the hat. Having been brought to earth from heaven by a missile, thrush carrying it in its toes. Hence its name. I guess that is a bird. I, I didn't catch that to just now when I read this earlier. So there is a bird that brings this, this thing down, and you do it a dove with something in her mouth. It's not the rep representation of Noah and the ark. It's a representation of this fertility and nonsense that's brought to you from all this junk of druids. All right. It was once known as the plant of peace. And God says, there is no peace to the wicked. Jesus said, I give you my peace. And no man can take it away. Not as the world give it. In ancient Scandinavia, or Navia, enemies were reconciled under it. Yet another reason why people came to kiss under the mistletoe. We ain't done. It was supposed to bring good luck and fertility. And even to protect from witchcraft the house in which it was hung. So Christian, you hang that mistletoe to keep witchcraft out of your house. I don't believe in witchcraft. What it says. We ain't done yet. Uh, I'm talking to Bible-believing Christians of a Baptist church now. I want to have me a stew listening. The silence as the crickets go in the night. A kiss is something which is at times associated with lust. So the practice of kissing under the mistletoe also had roots in orgies, celebrations, in connection with the Celtic Midsummer Eve ceremony. Orgies, fertility, an imitation Jesus Christ and, and, and between man and God. At the time the mistletoe was gathered, you ready for this one, Christian? The men would kiss each other as a display of their homosexuality. I want you to email me those who are against homosexuality. I want you to email me and tell me I, I am going to stop this practice right now. I dare you to. 
Kissing under the mill, under the millstone. Kissing under the mistletoe. It was done by men and men for their homosexuality. The custom later broadened to include both men and women. So in the beginning, it wasn't men and women. It was man and man working that which was unseemly, the Bible says. Kissing under the mistletoe is also suggestive of a temple prostitution and a sexual license flourishing during Roman Saturnia. Remember that yesterday? The worship of Saturn? You could get a license for, for being with a temple prostitute by kissing under the mistletoe. I guess we saw a mama kissing Santa Claus too. Because number six brings us to Santa Claus. And brother, you wait for me when I get my report done about Santa. When I do that one. Alright. Santa Claus. Number six. We having fun yet? Santa Claus or Father Christmas. You mean he's taken the name of God the Father. It is a corruption of the Dutch Saint Nicholas. Capital S-A-N-T, capital N-I-K-O-L-A-A-S. Saint Nicholas was the 4th century Catholic Bishop of Myra in Asia Minor who gave treats to children. I wouldn't trust a Roman Catholic with my child today if you gave me fourteen quadrillion dollars. You do know what the Catholic Church are doing with little children today, don't you? He was canonized by the Roman Catholic Church, regarded as a special friend and protector of children. Wait till you get my report on Santa Claus. I talk about Mr. Nicholas. I don't call him Saint. The red suit comes from the fact that Catholic bishops and cardinals in Italy wear red. I got to call some of that to question by my own report. Santa Claus was also known as Chris Kringle, a corruption of the German Chris Kandel, which which is C H R I S T K N D L, the Christ Child. This has to be one of the most subtle. Of Satan's blasphemies, yet most Christians are unaware of it until you hear my report, Lord willing. Okay. Originally, Santa Claus, the concept came from the pagan Egypt god, the Egyptian god Bess, capital B E S. Now, I'm going to say, I've reading this, I did not find this in my own research. I have no way of calling him a liar. I have no way. He may have had more information than I had. A rod turd, R O T U N D, grown like personage who was the patron of little children. Bess, or Bees, or whatever his name is, was said to live at the North Pole, working year round to produce toys for children who had good and obedient to their, to their parents. In Dutch, he was called the Sinter Cause, capital S-I-N-T-E-R, capital K-L-A-A-S. Dutch settlers brought the custom to America. In Holland, 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 in Holland and other European countries, the original Santa Claus was actually a grim personage who traveled the countryside, determined to find out who really had been naughty or nice. Those who had been acting up were similarly switched. That means they were that you take a, 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 a branch of a tree and you beat their behind. Don't you dare have anybody beat my children. The associ that's my job. The association of Santa Claus was snow, reindeer, and the North Pole suggests Scandinavian and Norse traditions of the Yuletide season. We'll talk about Yule in a minute. In Babylonia, there's that Babylonia. Notice how the same words keep coming up. Also, the stag or reindeer was a symbol of the mighty one 
Nimrod. Got a red nose, I guess. Nine. The symbolism of the antlers worn on the head of the noble leader would demonstrate his proudness as a hunter and thereby influence people to follow him. You mean he had antlers on his head? I like to see this guy show up down south with antlers on his head and see some southern shoot him. Sort of like something like a, a vice president did on a hunting trip. You guys say that. I don't know. Santa is a blasphemous substitute for God. He is routinely given supernatural powers and divine attributes which only God has. Think about it. He's made out to be omniscient. He knows when every child sleeps, the pervert. Better not be peeking in my windows. I'll give him something to look at. Up on the housetop, click, click, click. I just shied. Old Saint Nick awakes. He knows when a child awakes. He knows where they've been bad or good. And he knows exactly what every child wants. See Psalms 139, 1 through 4. He's made out to be omnipresent. Oh, I love gifts. No, that's not the present. On one night of the year, he visits all the good children in the world and leaves them gifts, seemingly being everywhere at the same time. Omnipresent means he can be everywhere. That's God. Next. He's also made to be omnipotent. He has the power to give to every child exactly what everyone wants. Wait till you get my study, Lord willing. Moreover, this one's good. I never got this one. I may add this to my report. Santa Claus is made out to be a sovereign judge. He answers to no one. And no one has authority over him. And when he comes to town, he comes with a bag full of rewards for all those that behave or was good and acceptable in his eyes. Wow. We got to go to Jesus Christ to be judged. Santa comes to us. I was going to see some. I was going to say something bad, and I'm glad I did it. Santa Claus has been one of the most popular and widely accepted and unposed myths ever to be successfully interwoven into the fabric and framework of Christianity. It is a fact that Christ was born, and truth surely. Greatly rejoice in the heart of every Christian the birth of Christ, of what Christ has done for us. But Santa Claus myth distorts the truth of Christ's birth by subtly blending truth with the myth of Santa Claus. When Christian parents lie to their children about Santa Claus, they are taking the attention of their children away from God and causing them to focus on a fat man. Na, 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 na. Fat man. In a red suit. Oh, I know a red dragon with godlike qualities. All of this teaches the child to believe that just like Santa, God can be pleased with good works done in order to earn his favor. Also, they teach that no matter how bad the child has been, he will still be rewarded by God. I mean, even they get a lump of coal. Just as Santa never failed to bring gifts, even in the homes of professing Christians, shame! Santa Claus has clearly displaced Jesus in the awareness and affections of children, becoming the undisputed spirit, symbol, and centerpiece of Christmas. What's wrong with the tree? What's wrong with Santa Claus? If you still got to ask yourself, you need to go back and reread. Rehear. I'm going to put this report next time I update our, our website. I'm going to put this report that's in Microsoft Word. And I will try to save it to Adobe. I will put this on our webpage. 
in both formats. So you can read. I know what some of you are going to do. You're going to read through this. You're going to say, ah, look what style he screwed up. Ah, he got that word wrong. Anything but the truth, huh? That's page 7 of 26. Happy Holidays.